Welcome to Altar of the Demo Gods. If you're wondering what advice from two experienced sales engineers sounds like, it's a little like this. All right, and welcome back to Altar of the Demo Gods. This is our third episode. I'm joined with my friend and co-host, John Morton. John, how you doing? Living that dream, Keith. I don't know what day it is, but it's a good day. <laughs> well, I mean, oh, you don't know what day it I is. I don't know if it's, I think it's Thursday. Might be Wednesday. I'm not sure. It's, it is Thursday. Right. You are correct. Good. Yeah, today is Thursday, which is, uh, that's a good thing, I guess, that, that you uh, guessed the date correctly. Why is it that you're so, so confused? It is. I, and I think I know why, because I've been there, I've been there before and I, I talked to you earlier yeah, this week. Yeah. So, so Monday I, uh, had a trip to Boston, had to drive from Boston to Connecticut. I had about 14 hours of traveling by air and then like, you know, driving and traveling from mountain time, which is the most awesome time. It's vacation time to East coast time is like, I lose hours and like losing those days really, really messes you up. Yeah, travel can do that, and I think we'll talk about that in another episode. Uh, you and I were, were chatting, and I think the whole travel thing is something we can definitely spend some time talking about. But uh, travel, uh, and when you're an SC, you can you can do a lot of it. Um, that can have a, a tendency to make you forget what day of the week <laughs> it, it is or what state you're in. Even Time zone. So ex- exciting week for more exactly. <laughs> So um, our last episode, we talked about uh, SE career pathing briefly. So if you didn't listen to uh, episode two, go ahead and and listen to that one. And um, we talked about John's story. And we, I even talked a little bit about how I got started. But we talked about John's story through uh, beginning to, to field CTO. Um was there anything memorable from you for the for the last episode? Yeah, I mean, I uh, you know, me and Keith do some editing ourselves because we're a young burgeoning startup here at Altar of the Demo Gods and Podcasts. So re-listening to it, I was in an airport, right, listening to the audio, and there's so much you know missing context from the story that makes it more beautiful. But we only have a few minutes to explain the path that uh. It's those little nuances we'll highlight as the podcast progresses that that makes this whole experience worth it and fun. So I don't have anything specific, but it's the net of it is that, you know, there's so much more to these stories we share here that uh, we can't capture immediately. Yeah, you said something, uh, I can't remember if it was the first episode or the second episode, but something along the lines of um, when you... I forget what it was, but you're telling a story about how you knew that you were an SE, what the moment was. But it, I kind of it rolls into what I want to talk about tonight, and that's those those core competencies that you that you look for while well, you as a field CTO and as a as a leader now that you look for in a sales engineer. And I can talk about them as well from not necessarily a leadership point of view, but from the sales engineer point of view, from different core competencies and and personality traits even that I think have helped, helped yeah. me. Yeah, absolutely. And I just yeah. hired someone um, in the past. He started on Monday and yeah, he's working with me now. And those are the things we're looking for. So this is a great topic to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've written down a couple of what I think core competencies are just kind of in, in preparation for the show. I want to, I want to know what, what your number one thing that you're looking for is as a, as an SE leader, what's the number one core competency? Somebody's got to check check that box on first thing, just so you don't have to worry about. Yeah. It. So from previous, you know, the previous episodes, we talked about big S, big E. The number one thing I look for personally when hiring, there's two traits I look for: coachable and curious. But they're related to this. If you cannot pass test number one, which is, do you have the ability to communicate? Uh, you immediately are ruled out by me. And I can determine that within two minutes. Do you have the ability to communicate? Simple as that. So communication, talk more about that. Let's let's dive into that because, I mean, that's that's a big umbrella, mm-hmm. right? And 
just say, I think tossing the word of communication out there automatically makes somebody think, well, maybe not everybody, but may make people who <laughs> like me who overthink things go, oh shit. So you're telling me I need to have a degree in communications yeah, as well good point. to, to good do good this. Point. And, and it's, it's not necessary. Right, right, that. right. So, so let Let's let's double click on that. What what is, what about communication? Yeah, so there's um two things that I look for specifically in elementary Sesame Street knowledge that we like to drop on this podcast here, Keith. And this applies to both sales and sales engineering is lesson number one, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. I keep it this simple. Two ears because we should do it's a, it's, a, it's a lesson your mama taught you. We do, especially if you're trying to chat up somebody you're interested in, right? Sales, communicating is a lot like dating, right? You got to gotta know how to communicate. When you're, when you're a guy that looks like me, right? I'm only one step below Tom Brady, for those who have never seen me in the look section. You got to be able to communicate. That's just in your, that's just in your athletic prowess. <laughs> athletic prowess, you know, physical dominance. <laughs> So the net of it is two ears, one mouth. That means you have to do twice as much listening as you do talking. And by listening, I mean act actively listening. Not just listening, waiting for your turn to talk, but ingesting data, learning something about what this person's saying, and then being able to reflect that back. So actively listening, two ears, one mouth, twice as much as you do talk. That's that's what I'm at the core of it talking about with communication. Yeah. I, you know, that I, that, that resonates with me. When I was first trying to become an SE, I had a conversation with an SE manager who was, who was uh, hiring at the time. And um, he was, he told me he's like one of the most, I, I think one of the things, again, you know, him him saying this to me, one of the things you're going to have the hardest time with is is being quiet and listening, right? And that's something that was great feedback to hear because I, I got that before I even really got into my career as an SE. So I, I took that to heart as soon as I got the chance to get that SE position. I had to focus and work really hard on it, but I think it helped and learn how to shut my mouth or ask the right questions, then shut my mouth and listen to to what the, the customer yeah. or the prospective customer has to say to me. Dude, so, yeah, and, and it will take this a step further, right? The point of this podcast is a spiral in into ideas. But a lot of folks, the most power, here's tip number one. Anybody listening to episode three of Alter of the Demo Gods is going to make a million dollars on this. If you can master the awkward silence while listening, you will have a million billion dollar career. That means while Keith's talking to me and he's telling me things and I'm looking at him with my Tom Brady glare and he's in charmed by the looks, just waiting that extra second before you even say something is such a powerful tool in communication. People freak out. The immediately muscle reflex want to start diary of the mouth talking about themselves. So that's what I'm looking for. Do you have the ability to communicate in listening and, you know, kind of digesting these things? Yeah, there's a lot of power, I think, in silence. And it's something that I, I try to teach my son. He's he's still pretty young, but um, it's it's and when he talks a lot, too, he's like his father. But there's there's a <laughs> lot about asking a question and then sitting there quietly because somebody's going to fill that yep. void. You just don't want to be that person. You want to let the other person feel because most people are going to feel uncomfortable in that silence. And if you're practiced in it, if you're practiced in sitting and being comfortable in silence, then you're going to come out on top. You're right. That is, that's a million dollar tip. Yeah, I'm telling you, man, that's why people are tuning in, Keith. So communication to me is number one thing I look for normally in, in you know, the scenario. Okay. What about technical competency in product? And when I say that, I don't mean the specific thing that your company sells, right. but in the industry as a whole, right? So for you and I, security, yeah. right? 
the the person's technical competency and security. Um, if I sell switches and routers, doesn't really matter which one, but that person's technical competency in in route yep. switch, right? Um, obviously, if they have high level technical knowledge of your products, then that's just even more awesome. But w- w- how much weight do you put on that technical competency in the so product? I measure it in a very unique way, right? And I've had success with this over numerous years, going back to my time in the U.S. Navy working on a submarine where you used to operate some of the most complex technical systems you can imagine. What I'm not looking for is somebody who wants to tell me how smart they are. They want to try to bombard me with technical jargon and, you know, algorithms, you know, recipes, big words that make them look smart. That That is a big turnoff. Right? What I'm looking for, regardless of your technical expertise, is can you distill a message into a very articulate and simple manner of explaining it to me like I'm five years old? If you can do that, if you can very quickly tell me something very complex and technical in the most simplest way in under a minute, again, million dollar tip, baby. I don't care how smart you think you are. Yeah. I, I, I think another part of it and i feel like we're hopping around because these are all good um and there's so many of them there's so many more i want to hit but we only have so much time in an episode right so and i each of these almost deserves its own episode including the next one i'm going to mention i want to get your thoughts on this demo yeah demoing is another good one right their 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 ability to not only follow a script and do do the demo right the the corporate demo but how can they work on the fly? How do they adapt? Yep. How do they <laughs> how do they deal when the demo gods are not in their favor? Again, where the with the title of this or where I'll, the I'll title make a quick example of that. From, right? So it goes back to again to the two things I said: active listening, right, two ears, one mouth, as well as explaining simply. So if you sell a product, let's just pick on the cloud, and your product, you know, you do AWS. It's a cloud platform. And the customer you're engaging with, they, you make intros and they tell you, I don't have anything in AWS. All I do is in GCP, Google Cloud Platform. If you immediately go to demo AWS, like the capabilities in a product, they have no interest in and they don't use, you failed. 101. Right, because you, you didn't, didn't listen. listen. Well, you failed immediately because you didn't, you didn't listen. listen yeah. And then you're showing them something mm. they don't care about. So... Even if it's very lightweight, I like to do something even in demoing. So let's say you were active listening. You heard what they do in GCP and you can demo something like that, right? Can you very quickly set the hook? Like you ever been fishing, Keith, like out on the water, right? And you think you you got a fish on the line and you like jerk the the pole real quick (laughs) to set the hook just in case they bit it. I like to do that quick two-minute demo where we're saying, bam, I think this hit the mark. Is this what you're looking for? I would like to go deeper. So you don't want to blow your load on the first demo. I don't know if that's appropriate. Uh, the, the message resonates. <laughs> oh, I would... <laughs> right. You want to be able to say, let me show you something that might pique your interest. And from there, we can spiral in again. We want the next meeting because we want to go deeper and understand their problem. No pain, no deal. But a demo, quick enough. Two minutes, explain it simply. It's about what they care about. Set that hook. Yeah. Well, and it it's the it's that process too. It's the the two ears, mm-hmm. right? Listening first of what it, let me ask the right questions, get the feedback from the customer to understand what's the most important to them so I know exactly how to bait that yeah. hook, right? Yep. Right? Because they they may be very they may have varying interests in different aspects or features of my product. But I may pick up on something com- in conversation that is absolutely crucial right. to them, right? And if, especially if it's something I know we do better than our competitors, you better damn well believe I'm demoing oh, that oh, right well. then, right there, just Keep so we can well get the next trained. meeting and, and dive deeper into all the other stuff they love, yep. right? Yeah, I, I haven't been out of the game that <laughs> long. Okay, so we've talked about um, listening, communication, um, technical competency in product, demoing, 
uh, answering on the fly. What about the sales process? Dude. What about understanding sales frameworks and just the process behind how it goes from, you know, lead to, uh, you know, a, say, a marketing qualified lead, the sales qualified lead to prospect, all that stuff to final sale, right? right? How important is that for the, the sales oh, it's, engineer? It's critical. We can't lose sight of the bigger picture. So always sales process should be at the back of everyone's mind. So before we even go to a meeting where we're going to do a demo, we should always do research. And this applies to sales and everyone, everyone in the sales org. We should do some research about the organization we're going to talk to. What does the customer do? What do they care about? We should gather that data. We should go into it as a sales team or individually saying, what do I want to get out of this meeting? What does the next step look like? What do I want? Do I want to get them to go to a POC? Do I want to talk to somebody else? We should know what the objective is coming out of this meeting. And while we're in it, from a sales perspective, we should be gathering valuable metrics about what matters. What do they have? What is their problem? What is their pain? Who's who in the zoo? Who are we talking to? Sales process is the overarching value of what we're doing. We're applying that charm, winking, smiling, and showing them what they like, where we're saying, is our product or our solution the right fit for what we're doing? So it should always be there. It should always be the underlying driver okay. of what we're doing, including what we want coming out of these meetings or next steps. So you you'd rate that one pretty high then. Um, Right. Uh, again, at the end of the day, driving revenue is what we do. This is just one way to get there in you know, meetings with technical expertise. Um, another one that I, I thought of, and you know, thinking about it more, I guess it's important, but it's not uber important, but well, maybe. I want to get your thoughts on it. Public speaking. Did it? Yeah, so public speaking, as you evolve through the trajectory of what you're doing, a lot of what we talked about up until now might be one-on-one -on -one or, you know, a sales team selling to a group of individuals, normally less than 10. It's normally not more than that, even in enterprise sales, one-to-one -one or less than 10. Public speaking is extremely valuable when you want to, you know, do something like become a field CTO or do something like, you know, what you do, Keith, with training folks at a higher level where you're talking to a mass audience. All the exact things we talked about matter, Right. You don't want to get up there like a robot and read from a script. Hello, my name is Fred and I'm selling candy bars from my school fundraiser. You want to be able to be able to speak confidently in front of a larger audience and convey messages, right, um, that are more broad. So it is absolutely a valuable skill set that if you want to evolve your trajectory as an SE is critical. Yeah. Yeah, I... I started public speaking pretty early in my SE career. Um, I wanted to instantly start kind of branding myself, you know, doing that own personal branding. And I, I'm I'm one of the few people that's already comfortable with public speaking. I know a lot of people are terrified of public speaking. You know, there's an old saying that people are more afraid. I forget who it was. I think it's a Seinfeld joke, but people are more afraid of uh, public speaking than they are of death. So the guy giving the eulogy would rather be the guy in the coffin. <laughs> <laughs> A terrible way to put it, but the concept remains. Yeah. I mean, yeah, a convoluted way to go about it. Um, but I don't know how much that, that's helped to me as an SE. It certainly helped my career, but I don't think that's SE specific. Specific. I don't think so either. That's that's what right, I'm trying to I, say. If you want to take it a step further, you want to be like a true evangelist. What's what I find interesting is everyone I interview, they normally I, tell me, Keith, I don't know about you, but they when they're new in the SE role, they always tell me, I would like to be looked at and thought of as a thought leader where I can present at conference XYZ. So their goal is to do public speaking, but it's not exactly a trait I need for them to do what they're doing like, right? Sure. Sure. And I, well, I think being an SE is great practice for public yeah. speaking, right? You're constantly in front of small groups. You have to think on your feet. percent. Another trait we kind of, we kind of hit on a little bit, right? If, if things in a meeting, if you're, you're picking up what they're putting down, you need to be able to analyze that on a fly, on the fly. So you know how that applies. So you understand what's important, all that good yep. stuff. Um, how do you develop some of these competencies though? Like, yeah. A lot of them, yeah. I, I feel like 
just say telling people like get good at communication we're kind of leaving them hanging out to dry there how do you how do you get good at communication yeah, well there's a couple ways right in sales there's roles like uh bdr sdr who do uh cold calling and they read a script and they do it on the fly one of the things i like to employ is role playing right so a lot of people don't appreciate the value of role playing where like right now me and keith can say hey keith you're my customer this is me i'm gonna pitch it you know go hard on me bro don't don't ease up oh that kind of role play right. not not the kind of work where we break out the swing and uh you know <laughs> go through the pumpkin spice not the uh, kind loop of it's it's a little easier. Not the kind where you're the cheerleader <laughs> at the car wash. I mean, if that's your thing, and that's how you learn with your, your shirt We've tied talked up. about this before on other podcasts. You know, there are enterprises that specialize in that. <laughs> we can help you there. But yeah, in that kind of role playing where we're just shooting, you know, shooting scenarios at each other and going through it, it breaks it down and makes it easy. Anybody averse to role playing, that's a red flag for me, right? That's the safe word where I'm saying you may not be right for this scenario. You don't want to do role playing. Maybe the same for you. Do you do any sort of role playing when you interview? Not necessarily during interviews, but as part of the indoctrination process. Matter of fact, this week we did that. Like we'd like to role play different personas. Here's what it's like to call into person X Y Z. Let's see how you handle it. The thing about it is, like it's a team sport. It's practicing. Back to my Tom Brady analogy, right? You got to learn the plays. You got to run through the plays. You got to practice with pads on. You got to practice hitting. I have football analogy, maybe some listeners, American football. But yeah, the more you practice, the more comfortable it becomes. You develop a muscle reflex in your mind about how to handle these scenarios, and it's less scary. It really is. Well, you're a military guy. I mean, how many times did you drill, 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 oh drill? God. So that so that you would be ready in case something That's happened, 90% right? That's 90% of so submarine all... life, baby. Running drills, yeah. you know, reactor scram, reactor operations, um, you know, flooding operations, fire operations. We practice, we train like we fight because it becomes memory. You will have no problem when it's real. And when you're selling, it's even right. easier. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, not to compare selling to combat or anything like that, but what I will say is it's still a high stress mm -hmm. situation, not as high stress as putting out a fire on a submarine <laughs> under the ocean. There is that. But. But it's a high stress situation where any sort of high stress situation you have to worry about amygdala hijacking, and that's where that that we called it croc brain um, in a in a yeah, past baby. life. But it's that that central part amygdala. of your brain that controls fight or flight. When that thing starts firing, it hijacks everything, yeah. right? So when you practice, when you prepare, that thing starts going off, right? When you're throwing a curveball, but you've practiced. You can ease that. You can calm yourself and you can just let that muscle memory take over. I think that's a great idea that you do role playing as part of your, your training. It's with a your great guys. feeling, man, because or gals, when didn't... you feel it fire off, you're almost excited. Like, man, I know how to run this play. It ain't new. I ain't scared. I ain't paralyzed, right? Paralysis. I'm ready. I'm ready to hit the pavement running. I'm getting jazzed up. Keith sees it. But the more you train, the more you do it, simple things like role playing, you become a second nature, right? It's like nine times out of 10 when I'm at a bar, I hear no, but that one, maybe, hey man, crop brain kicks in. You know what I'm saying? For the technical competencies, for the technical competencies, obviously those are easier to, to find training for generally, right? You have some sort of, I hope, background training and right. whatever it is you're technically selling, Foundational. right? Foundational. Yeah. So you're, you're probably going to have that already. I don't think that's as confusing to people. What about demoing? It's the same thing, man. I like to do role playing. Hey, demo for me this thing. Here's the time constraints. Yeah. Let's let's do some role playing, right? You should get used to like, it's okay to learn a robotic script and then deviate, right, based on feedback. But again, um, it's just like basics 101. Practice the thing. Do the thing. You know, pitch it to your wife, pitch it to your mom, pitch it to your grandma, pitch it to some hobo on the street. Hey, man, you got two minutes to hear this yeah. pitch, I'll give you a dollar. Right? Even if it's, you break out your laptop, you're like, sir, look <laughs> at this screen. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd advise that. <laughs> Whatever it takes to win. But the, the, the net is, right? Practice makes perfect. So that's that's simple as that. Yeah. I... Uh, um. I remember it's been so long since I've read it, but I do remember when I was 
trying to become an SE. Uh, before I started my first role that I got, I read the book Great Demo. Um, I don't know if you ever read that I don't that think I did, now. But that one, they, they give some pretty good general advice if you've never really done any demos uh, before. When I, when I say demo, which is now realizing we keep saying demo like it's something everybody should know, even though it's part of our title and everything. I'm talking about demonstration, a technical demonstration of the product. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's not a lot of books out there that are written on, on demoing. That's one of them. Or just being, you know, specific to an SE in general, uh, there's tons on communication. I, I don't have any. Right. Any I don't think I ever saw anything specifically um, to demoing. You're right. But again, it's just kind of learning the products, learning what message you want to share, what problem you want to solve and just doing it uh, effectively and just practicing it. I know it sounds simple, but you know, you, you got, you got kids there, Keith, and I'll, I'm sure they've practiced what they wanted to show you some cool trick they learned because they're going to demo it to yeah. you. And you know, it's just, just getting that, that good at that. Yeah. What about the sales process though? So I, I kind of learned based on experience. How did you learn sales process? Cause mine was just asking questions to the sales guy that I was working with and paying attention in, in sales meetings. Yeah, that's, and... that's somewhere where actually I followed a very strategic method of training from, you know, a guy named John McMahon who laid out this concept of medic in force management. So there was a, a doctrine around it. It's a little bit more heavy on traditional sales versus tech sales, but that's where it was just beat into us daily. And part of that role playing is using that vocabulary from that sort of metrics around medic and understanding what do these things mean? Are we all speaking the same language when we do role playing? Are we doing the same thing? So there is a lot more discipline there. Um, there's also Sandler training. There's different training specific to sales. So that's where I got indoctrinated into it and just practice it over time. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we can, we can spend again, we could probably do a couple episodes on medic and med pack oh, and goodness. all that. We can do one Forever. for each, for each letter of the acronym. Um, man, this has been a, a great episode. I, I think it's, it's been filled with a lot. Um, when we talk about personality traits, core competencies, um, get at us. If, if there's something you as an SE think is a core competency that we missed, email us demogodspod at gmail.com um, if you've got questions for us you can email us demogodspod at gmail.com you can also visit our web website at demogodspod.com uh, my name's Keith Wilson John uh, it's been it's been a great episode and uh, let's see what are, what are we talking about next week we're talking about uh, demystifying the cloud SAS pass uh, how do you it's not I ass. It can't be I ass. So I always just end up saying I A A S. Or no, I never thought about it as I ass, but it, you could say that. Yeah, yeah. And on prem. So we'll talk about more of that in the next episode. Uh, but thanks everyone for tuning in to Alter of the Demo Gods.